Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming along to uh, this uh, very special reading, uh, a lunchtime reading to accommodate the uh, time difference between here and China, because two of the readers are in China today. Uh, as you will know, uh, David Tate, it's the launch of his um, rather wonderful collection and a unique collection uh, by degrees. And uh, his good friend and uh, uh, excellent poet, uh, Aidan Hong, is also reading um, from China, uh, just a little bit closer to most of us, I guess. Uh, we have Kim Moore, who will be reading from Cumbria. They'll be reading uh, uh, Aidan first, then uh, Kim, then David, and they'll be reading for 15 minutes and David for 20. Those are the important things uh, to let you know. Also, it's very nice at the end, we're going to have a, a, a question and answer session. So if you can come up with some lively, interesting questions, that would be very good. Otherwise, you'll have my dull ones. Um, it's a pleasure. I hope the poets are going to join uh, me. Uh, perhaps uh, Aidan's going to come up first. Hello, Aidan. We've only just met, really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what time is it where you are? It's like 9 p.m. at night, but it's all right. It's a big time. So I'm here for David to celebrate his new book. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And uh, we've obviously we've seen your poems uh, in print, as it were, but never heard you read. Uh, it's very good that you're going to be. We'll, we'll be having the poems on screen, I think, as we go along. I'm going to just embarrass you a little bit by saying um, uh, Aidan Hong is a Chinese poet from a Tibetan autonomous town currently living in Shanghai. His poems written in English appeared or are forthcoming in the Australian Poetry Journal, the Missouri Review, the Cordite Poetry Review, Char, parentheses, Hobart, among other places. He was poet in residence at Swatch Art Peace Hotel, Varuna Poetry Masterclass Fellow, and a finalist. How can you keep up with this? You'll, you'll never live up to this introduction. Um, Diode Editions book content in the USA. Uh, please welcome everyone, Aidan Hong. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next time I really should keep my intro within like 10 words. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. Anyway, thank you everyone and good evening to David Kim and the lovely people of poetry business for inviting me here. And I really love David's new book by degrees, which is absolutely stunning. So grab a copy, grab a copy while you can. And uh, so here are my poems I'm going to read tonight, so several of them. So bear with me and thank you. So first of all, it's Triptych of Southern Sea. It was written in the coastal city of Sanya, China. So let's start. Triptych of Southern Sea, one. Green is the color of rain as it falls Icarus into the sea's surface, but quieter, or am too lost into the blue. Strange, no boats ducked at the bay, a solitary gull circling above me, slashing the silver line of a horizon. And the waves come shoveled ashore, shattered among rocks drowned in their brown, sitting in my patio, protected by the roof. I cannot fathom the heaviness of land's broken neck tensions, but from far, far away in the gauzy fog, it gleams like an ice cap, the sun. Two, I stand alone, taunted by white teeth of the sea, though her blue face is tinged with gold. It's difficult to see fish here or tucked into water's velvety brocade. But crustaceans, the color of sand, pelt into rock's tiny fingers. Day moon hovers like an epiphany. Almost noon, I'll make do with what I have, a handful of time, though sipping from my palms like sand, into waves that break at my toes. Maybe I should wait further and taste the salt before the sick starlight falls scarring the perfect surface. 
but there's always tomorrow. I think there's always something I have to leave on the shore. Three, I can't sleep. The sea shouts November and the new moon has broken into sequence. This is not the coast for the homecoming. No lighthouse stands poking against the sky and the city is launched into groves of palm trees. Shadows heap and buildings that help to be collected by dawn. But I still have time, a few more hours at least, before losing the dim orchard of night. So I walk to the patio, the painful softness surging in me. Before me, the sea trembles like a secret refusing to be told. Better it remains unattainable for the sake of all who will embark on a journey, each on his heroic course. Sailors, fishermen, poets, before day breaks and everything reveals itself to be less. Okay, the next poem on the slope of the dead was actually based on a tomb sweeping experience. So it's not particularly happy. On the slope of the dead, moss scrubs clean the headstone carvings, layers of moss like kelp on a dry coast. We've come a long way to this hillsuit slope, bypassing rocks that lurk like vigilantes. Our village ducks its tile gray head behind a corral of greenery and the air burns red like the incense he arranges in front of the stone. His name barely visible. If forgetting could be this quick, this easy. Ma calls out to him, expecting an answer. Perhaps a change of light, a stir in the woods, or simply a tremble of hands. I watch smoke rise and fall into streaks of ash, leaving a sign I don't understand. Ma knows, and she kowtows three times, mumbling words that soon wither in the air. But something lingers like an echo, like a shout. I ask her what she said. She smiles, never so happy. Her eyes lifted above us to the billowing clouds. Okay, the next one. A gay poem. Everyone loves a gay poem these days, don't they? Last warmth of the day. You slept on the couch, curling comfortably. Above you, the stucco withdrew deeper into gray, solemn like silence. A strand of hair streamed to your forehead, and your boyish face was a force that could easily bend me. Outside our room, the city sank into night. Summer could be cold, could be a river of soaked neons rising to the bastard moon because it worked on me. The light so smooth on my skin, I mistook it for a touch. I did not know I wanted then, and I not understand it now, but I remembered slipping out of my shirt then poured myself around your body like the last warmth of the day and locked your hands safely into mine. Era is about a visit to a very empty village in China, which is not that common, so era. Rare to walk into an empty village in this country where autumn has fattened persimmons, each hanging like an unlit lantern. And nooks abandoned yellow of chrysanthemums, phantoms of fragrance frigid on cobbled roads. A dozen houses, wooden boards bolted, whose termite-ridden gray sinks into mottled walls where dust gathers on clayed eaves. In the square, Baskets of little harvest, like inlays on an undone fresco, only a pillar with fading calligraphy telling a story of tea, simple stuff, traded across provinces by merchants whose heirs now 
migrant workers. I think I'm the only tourist here. Even my breath sounds stern, like struggling water in drying brooks. Otherwise, stillness burns like useless incense for a quiet god who changes as the village has changed. I too wear a face of the past, like a marbled thing, like this village with a pale, crumbled veneer, time's exquisite error. Okay, the last poem of this reading, I think, it's called Ear of the Ox. I actually back like earlier this year, I was doing this kind of poem back and forth thing with David. So this thing was actually inspired. This poem was actually inspired by David and his, his New Year poem. So it was actually written after and for David. So it's called Ear of the Ox. Ear of the Ox. I don't need lanterns to know it's almost the day, but they swing like misshapen fruit. Red upon red upon red, together and apart, they bridge things. The air grows colder, grows heavier each second, I would perhaps harden into rain. The wind comes like a shout. For once I disdain my body, which clings to the coat that makes me a man. For once I want to dissolve into the night. I'm the one who fares into red dust of this city unprepared because the new year patters on the doorway, hesitant like a guest with the wrong gift at the wrong time. But now the moon has rendered above. My eyes are tired, my hands old, and my love's far away. Open my eyes. As still the sky quivers like murky water held in hands, without a sign of the new and the festive. Even a wish sounds phony, full of the jangle of rusty coins. In my pocket, a receipt from yesterday, from yesteryear, curling like shame. I don't know how to repay those I le left behind, so I keep the evidence of my incompetency like skin retaining a scab to mark the pain. In my room, I press a photograph against the skyline to imagine different things, several faces perhaps, an optical display of absence in which I was a boy, now a man in, the, in this city disguised in lanterns, whose red will be shaken off in a few days, and I, as if from the hunter and the lost, have borrowed another hour to leave. Thank you so much. That's the that's all. That are the poems I'm gonna share tonight. Sorry, I was jumping in and out there. That was great, Aidan. Uh, uh, they're so rich, those poems, so many rich images and such a, a really uh, strong voice, I think. Uh, lyrical and strong um well you know this you don't need me to tell you but um, thank you very much for reading for us and particularly um on this occasion i can see uh the link with david's poems really good now it's my pleasure to to introduce kim moore uh who everyone here will know kim i guess uh Anne and i account it one of our great uh, fortunes in life to work with Kim so much. Uh, we first, well, we knew her before, but she won our competition in 2011 with a pamphlet, If We Could Speak Like Wolves. Was it, was that Carol Ann who would judge that or, yeah. Um, we're on first name terms, you know, uh, Dame Professor Carol Ann Duffy and I. And uh, we're, uh, very pleased that Kim is going to read now. I'm assuming that you'll be reading from this new book, which is, well, you know, it's a wonderful book, All the Men I Never Married, uh, published by Seren this year. Uh, upcoming, and so it's very nice for us that we're working with uh, Kim on this, is a prose book, her first prose book, uh, a non-fiction, uh, sorry, yeah, a non-fiction book called What the Trumpet Ta Taught Me, What the Trumpet Taught Me. It is uh, a marvellous Thing. really really wonderful anyway we're here uh to have kim moore the poet and uh please uh, welcome kim 
Thanks, Peter. Thanks for that lovely, lovely introduction. And it's great to be here. And um, I love the poems, Aidan, if you're, if you're still there. It's really beautiful, beautiful poems. And I love that line, um, here's a gay poem. We all like a gay poem. We definitely all like a gay poem. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, I've tried to pick poems I don't normally read aloud because the thing with online reading is people can hear you more than once, can't they? So I've tried to pick poems I don't normally um, read, but the first one um, I have read before. But yeah, so this is the first poem in the book, All the Men I Never Married. We are coming under cover of darkness with our strawberry marks, our familiars. Our third nipples, our ill-mannered bodies, our childhoods spent hobbled like horses, where we were told to keep our legs closed, where we sat in the light of a window and posed and waited for the makers of the world to tell us again how a woman is made. We are arriving from the narrow places, from the spaces we were given, with our curses and our spells and our solitude. With our potions, we swallow to shrink as small as insects or stretches into giants. For yes, there are giants amongst us, we must warn you. There will be riots. We're carrying all that we know about silence as we return from the forests and towers, unmaking ourselves, stepping from the pages of books, from the eye of the camera, from the cages we built for each other, the frames of paintings, from every place we were lost and afraid in. We stand at the base of our own spines and watch tree turn to bone and climb each vertebrae to crawl back into our minds. We've been out of our minds all this time. Our bodies saying no, we were not born for this, dragging the snare and the wire behind us. Um, <clears throat> so it's really nice to be here for David's, David's launch as well. Um, uh, it's great. I, the pamphlet's amazing. I can't wait to, to see a physical physical copy of it. Um, and yeah, David's a great friend of mine and it's it's an honour to read, read at the launch. And my book is definitely a better book because of David. I sent it to him about, or a version of it, about three or four years ago. And he said to me, um, it's not ready. And I was quite put out at the time. Um, and then went away and thought about it and realised that he was right. So um, I think if he hadn't said that, it would have been, I don't know, a weaker book. So thank you, David. He's a, he's a great, great editor and a great friend. Um, so this is All the Men I Never Married, number eight. Um, uh, if you're following along, if you've got the poems up on the screen, you'll see that part of the poems in italics. I've just realised that might not work as well to read out. But um, And there's an, an epigraph from Adrian Rich. You must read and write as if your life depended on it. Um, and the italics bit is like meant to be a kind of inner monologue. But yeah, I didn't think about this before. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I should do like a little movement for the italic bit. No, I'm not going to do that. That would be terrible. Um, anyway, All the Men I Never Married, number eight. On the train, a man asks me what I'm reading. The mind is an empty and flooded field. He tells me about his job and his wife and his children. The mind is water rising through green. He tells me about money and Brexit and immigration. The mind is a tree at the edge of the field. I put my book away. Repeat, repeat. I put my book away. I've been putting my book away all my life. I put away my hands and my mouth and my eyes. I've been a long time without thinking. I can sit here and listen and live without field or water or green. I've been a long time without thoughts of my own. Or go back and fold into myself. White birds with no names. They row away through the air. Or enter and drink at the shallow place. Enter and prepare to be followed. I am worried about madness and the next 60 seconds. I put away my heart and the stillness inside. I smile and say, what do you do? Tell me again. And how many kids do you have? Remind me again of your wife. Um, so the next two poems are all about kind of or have links with with my old life as a as a music teacher and as a 
Um, I used to play trumpet kind of semi-professionally until I, I stopped. I retired for about six years because of performance anxiety. And I've, I've, I've started playing again and I'm working on this trumpet book with, with um, poetry business, as Peter said. And I don't know if the act of writing the book has then driven me back to, to playing music because I've, I've joined a brass band again and I'm, I'm practicing playing in the Messiah in December. So it's kind of writing about it has, has conjured it into reality. Um, so I thought I would read kind of two poems to all the men I never married poems, which are about music. And this one is really a, Chris, a December poem, but I always think November kind of blurs into December anyway. Um, and it's about a conductor that I, I used to, used to um, my old brass band conductor, who was a really inspirational teacher. Um, all the men I never married, number 27. Each week you jumped up and down in frustration, your gray hair flopping like a broken wing. Once you threw the baton across the classroom and hit the drummer in the eye. At rehearsals, you always wore the same faded jeans, the same off-white trainers laced up tight. But at concerts appeared in shirts that billowed as you moved, sat in white with red hearts or blue with yellow polka dots. You said the outfits were just to make us smile, distract us from our nerves. I walk past the brass band playing carols and think of us back then, those evenings playing under lampposts in a pool of light, Coventry Carol in the bleak midwinter, hark the herald angels sing. One night it was so cold, all the valves froze solid, first the bass and euphonium, then the baritone stopped speaking. Like animals dying from thirst, they fell in order of size, tenor horns next then cornets one by one, and yours the last to stop its song. It's been years, but sometimes I repeat your words without thinking. Today I too was moved to jump up and down as my junior band slowed to a crawl. I roll up my sleeves, trace the same patterns in the air. All the men I never married, number 34. I clip the mic to the bell of my trumpet, set my shoulders into a frame that will hold the trumpet steady, hold it true. Take a breath, draw myself into my body. I am still, like sand coming to rest in a glass of water. Nobody taught me this. No man could put this into language. Not my teacher, arriving for lessons on his motorbike, long hair streaming behind, unheard of where I was from, a man with a hair bubble, just imagine. He taught me the word gig. I didn't know what it was, thought it was something like a jig, some grand adventure. He taught me many things, how to be always on the road, rushing between one thing and another. My first paid gig at the Haymarket Theatre. He taught me to watch the conductor, to mark up the parts with cues, to run to the bar and save his place. Said, if in doubt, blast it out. And no such thing as an uncertain trumpet. That you could do something you loved and live. That this life, though not lifting, carrying, wiping, cleaning, that this life was work. Um, and I'm just going to read one more poem, which again is about um, teaching and um, uh, I'm trying to write about the kind of possibilities of, of nuance and that you can have an amazing teacher who's also a bit of a misogynist and they, these two things can be true and we can, you know, we can hold these two things. Um, I had a, a tutor when I was first starting out as a writer who told me not to write about um, I'd bought a poem about straightening my mum's hair and he told me not to write about it, that it was um, pointless and women's hair wasn't interesting. And it's taken me this long to, to rewrite the poem. So that was about 12 years ago. So all the men I never married, number 48. When he told me not to tell the story of my mother's hair, I was obedient for many years until I saw the video of wild horses in Patagonia tamed by increments over many days 
the gaucho calm and still when the horse met his gaze, then shooing it as it looks away. And so the horse learns that only when it gives its whole attention to this man will it ever feel peace again. And of course, my mother is not a horse. She would never be fooled by such a trick. But maybe the man who told me not to tell is the gaucho. Maybe once I was a horse to spend all these years listening to his voice. He told me this was women's business, that the world was not interested in such things. He said, listen to me, read Eliot until you fall asleep or until the red wine runs out. And so we did, all of us who had gathered there to learn. He stood in front of the curved window, the bats crisscrossed the lawn. He did not hold a book or open his eyes to see if we were there. The room took his voice and gave it back to every corner. It felt as if he whispered in my ear. I have held my tongue for years. My mother's hair. I did as I was told. He sat for hours between my legs as if she was the child and I the mother. I straightened her hair, every curl and kink, dividing it into smaller and smaller sections. The hiss of steam. The TV in the background. My father elsewhere and part of me still there, part of me in the library with the man who told me not to speak about such things, the lawn, the drifting dusk, the bats, my mother's hair, my hands, that house, the shudder of a horse's flank. Wow, thank you, Kim. So measured and precise and uh, really eloquent. It's really wonderful reading. And um, it, now uh, I've finally looked at chat. Those people who have been meaning to ask a question and haven't put one in, uh, do, do, uh, do send through a question for the uh, Q&A afterwards. And um, those people who would like to see the poems on screen, I've just noticed in chat that it says that there's a link to them in YouTube chat if you'd like to read along. Uh, so it will be for David's. Uh, if you want to do that, please do. Um, David's going to read uh, for 20 minutes uh, from this new collection, which really was prompted this. Uh, hi, hi, great, David. Um, which prompted this uh, launch, of course, and uh, hearing these three great poets. Uh, the collection is a pamphlet that we talked about when the pandemic was, wasn't very far along, I think, and it started in your part of the world, didn't it? And you experienced it in a different way to the rest of us. In fact, we didn't, well, some people over here didn't believe it was happening at all, um, uh, which is something, uh, of the tenor of some of your poems in this collection. It, it's been a privilege to work with you on it, David. I'm just going to say a little bit about you. you this will come as a surprise, I expect, that your books include Self-Portrait with the Happiness, which was shortlisted for the Fenton Albra First Collection Prize and was recipient of an Eric Gregory Award, and the AQI, which was shortlisted for the Ledbury 40 Prize. Um, I remember in amongst reading uh, from a pamphlet of yours that we just done at the British Library uh, when you were shortlisted for the Michael Marks. And I, because you you weren't over here, I read two of the poems from it and I, in the British Library. And when I read to the people there, I could see this collective, oh no, we should have given David the prize because he didn't win. And, uh, but I, obviously it's partly my brilliant reading, but the strength of the poems, uh, anyway. Here we are uh, to uh, celebrate uh, this new uh, pamphlet of yours, which is called By Degrees. Please uh, listen to David Tate. Hello, everybody. Thank you um, very much for, for joining us today. And thanks um, everyone for organizing this reading um, to P Peter and Anne, to Susie, uh, to Katie and to, to Eva. And thanks uh, hugely as well to Aidan and Kim for both agreeing to read and such, uh, such wonderful readings um, they were as well. 
Remembering Glen Torridon. I pulled into the passing place and let you overtake because I was in no hurry, because these roads were almost unknown to me and it was good to put a face to the high fells I'd only seen on maps and their names, Lertak, Bauspine, Skoruad, names of flint and ice and big fires. And because I felt safe there, where there are more stags than people, where snow poles mark the road for the deep, slow snows of winter, I pulled into the passing place and let you overtake. But how was I to know that it would be you in that car, winding down your window and grinning your desolate grin, alone in the passing place? when no one hears a thing. Um, <clears throat> a number of the poems from the pamphlet um, were written during the time uh, of the emergence of COVID-19 here in China. So I live in Shanghai. Uh, Wuhan is approximately, I think about 500 miles away, but everything's connected by bullet trains. So everything always feels remarkably closer than it is. To give you an example, I um, I used to live in Nanjing. From Nanjing to Shanghai on the bullet train takes 50 minutes to get here, but the distance is equivalent as between Lancaster and Edinburgh, which would take two and a half hours. So even though things are far away, everything feels very close and very connected. And as the situation unfolded in Wuhan, everybody started to feel increasingly nervous and um, China's reaction to the pandemic was that of urgency, that of shutting everything down, making sure things don't spread. Meanwhile, in, in the UK and in Europe, it was a, a much more, I think we can agree, a laissez-faire kind of attitude. Um, you know, maybe this will go away, maybe it's not real. So some of the poems that I wrote were sort of written as that was happening, um, including this one, um, By Degrees. The security guard puts the gun to my head, then clicks. He turns it to show me, 36 degrees, and waves me in, his expression hidden behind his mask, his eyes vacant. I walk around the almost empty supermarket. No eggs, no veg, the milk sold out, less pasta than three days ago. Chinese New Year music still plays on the store's radio. It's merriness like a slap. People queue up rather than use self-service, nervous to touch what others have touched. Heading back, I see my apartment is sealed off. I must walk round the back to the other entrance, guarded now by five policemen with temperature guns. I go in, and they scan me again, 37 degrees. Other cities don't have it like this. Going out like this is a privilege. The virus at my window. The street below us is still firmly shut. Apart from the realtors for some reason and the fruit shop, with its oranges and dragon fruit. Everyone going past is wearing masks and walking slowly, as though on tiptoe, as though, as though having nowhere to go. It's quiet too. The winter smog drifts like a sinister mist, and the woman next door plays her new piano, bought in a moment of quarantined boredom. She gives it up and we hear the birds. Pigeons and sparrows, rare to hear them, and then the distant mewling of an ambulance siren. It's heading this way, and everyone on the street stops to watch it. It's passing, it isn't slowing down. The people on the street breathe, then keep walking. Um, I remember at the time, uh, I was, Advise, advising friends back in the UK 
you know this this needs to be taken uh, this needs to be taken seriously you need to take precautions you need to wear masks um i, I was basically an anti-vaxxer's nightmare um or or a hysterical uh, person whichever way uh, <laughs> you know you wanted to look at it at the time and i remember i used to go for some reason that somebody who joined one of mine and kim's writing retreats a really nice lady called tara asked me to be on Radio Cumbria a couple of times and I was sort of Radio Cumbria's official Shanghai correspondent slash harbinger of doom um, and I, I, I sort of used to used to go on about it and that there came a point where um, I think 20,000 deaths had been recorded around the world um, and I, I kind of thought how you know, 20,000, that's so many people. How do you even imagine that many people dying from, from something like this? Um, and so the next poem was, was a way to kind of help people visualize that, I suppose. The Pitch Invasion. If 30 more people were to die from this, the deaths could fill the Vitality Stadium, the home of Bournemouth FC. The armed forces could bring in the bodies, driving convoys along the town's promenade before ensuring that each has a seat. The teams could prepare in isolation. The newly dead could be brought in as stewards. Mike Dean could volunteer as referee. The minute silence would be perfectly observed and everyone could watch from home as Nathan Ake punts it long to Callum Wilson. If they score, no one would jump into the crowd. Even VAR would turn a blind eye to the marginal toe beyond the nose of the last defender. The dead keep rising and the demand goes up. Soon there'll be enough to fill Old Trafford, the San Siro, the Bernabeu. It's happening now. And if the numbers seem abstract, think of the stadium of your local team, the dead, already taking up each seat, both dugouts and spilling onto the pitch. There are poems um, that you read by other people and they, they keep coming back as a bit of a motif in your own writing. And one such poem for me that I've now um, been inspired by twice in different situations is Carol Bromley's um, amazing poem, A Candle for Leslie, um, which is a poem I'd very much recommend you checking out. Um, and this poem is, I, I, yeah, it, I think it is quite inspired by Carol's, um, Carol's poem. Um, I should probably write after Carol Bromley, but it, at the time it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't see it. So Carol, if you're watching, um, it, it, you know, <laughs> I, sh I will write in in Biro after Carol Bromley, but it's always a poem that's on my mind when I'm writing. And, uh, this poem, I think, is just one that always comes back to me. Candles. When this was all getting started, I lit a candle for each of the dead. If you ask why I decided to do this, I'd say it's because I was helpless, because of that man on the street in Wuhan who lay back as if looking at the sky, who was photographed dead soon after, clutching tight to his white shopping bag. Candle after candle after candle until I couldn't get candles anymore. So I resorted to lighting, then blowing one out, keeping count as the numbers went up. My flat had the air of York Minster, and each day I took to my task of counting the dead and igniting the wick and then blowing them out just as fast. So no, now I light candles for England, which is more than the government will do. Don't be seduced by convenient truths, or I might light a candle for you. Um, yeah, this is a really bleak book. I apologize. The, the, the book, it started well. The first book was like a poem, of a book of love poems, but it we've gone sort of downhill to air pollution and, and pandemic. So I, I dread to think what the next book will be about. Um, this was kind of an imagined situation um, at the time when I was writing it, but. Um, I think um, some of us have even experienced the, the sort of the cold hard reality of this um, this next next poem, the Skype funerals. A day or so in, it becomes clear 
that crematoriums have better Wi-Fi than churches, that outside is better than inside, that it's easier to stand two meters apart than to shuffle onto the old pews, that trying to sanitize the seats will earn you unholy glances from the vicar and Jesus neglected on his cross. In any case, for many, this has been the death of faith. O oh Lord, who have sent this pestilence protectors, doesn't seem to hold much weight with this family standing meters apart, only five allowed to mourn in person, the rest of us joining on our phones or laptops, trying to get our sadness right. In churches, they tried beaming our images onto the walls, mosaics of grief, but it doesn't work. And crematoriums seem better, the body burning unseen in a quiet room, already burned at the hospital, truth be told, the morgue out of space, and something of a vengeance in the heart of the doctors who want to see this dead before they die. Um, a couple more poems to go. As Kim very often says, this is your, uh, your two poem warning. Um, so it's almost, we're almost through. Um, this next poem, I guess, um, I've been in, last time I got to come home was um, 2019, December. Uh, it's very hard for me to come back to England uh, just because it's very hard to get back to China where my, my partner lives and my job is and, and livelihood. Um, so this is kind of towards the end of the pamphlet, there are poems that are kind of a little bit homesicky, I suppose, and a little bit thinking about the area I'm from, which is uh, Lancaster near the Lake District. Um, and this is a poem kind of sort of self-pitying in, in its own way um, called The Snow Line. I miss how the fields would give way to snow how it seemed decided between the world and its watcher, the exact moment that whiteness would grow tangible. Then fells, bright white and endless, as if you could bow your head across the snow line, then raise it and be covered with a crown of frost, fat icicles dangling from your beard. I remember a farmhouse, one straddling the middle and felt jealous at the gift they'd been given a front door of spring and a garden of winter. Whenever my heart walks through the snow line, I stop to listen to the whispering trees and I wonder if I'll ever make it home. Um, last poem for me um, is the last poem of the pamphlet, fittingly, I think. Um, <clears throat> and, um, Last year we went for we went for a little holiday and and because you can't really leave China the ho the holiday that we decided to go to we decided to visit a volcano on the North Korean border, um, as you do, and um, it's this it's an amazing place called Changbai Mountain Changbai Shan Google it if you you get the chance um, and if you get the chance to come to China and visit please please do it's amazing, um, and. We, we went to the top of this and just spent hours looking at it. And the way that the mist sort of scurled down into the, into the dome of the, the volcano and the lake in the middle um, was very affecting at the, at the time. And thank you all for listening. Um, at Tian Shu Lake. There's a small boat rowing out from the North Korean border and it's the only surface movement on the lake too far off by far for us to hear it. The military base over there, like a cabin that can only be accessed by a slide. The water changes turquoise in blotches, the lake a mirror of rolling clouds. And though our viewing platform teems with crowds, there's silence. Then the mist climbs the mountain, creeps slowly towards us. We stay for hours as it's all we're here for. We stay through the rain and through the hail. The mist comes and goes and with it the view. We watch a hawk hunting songbirds. We watch a tour group unfurl a banner that says the number one Chongqing battery company. Mostly we watch vapor, the way it climbs the far side of the mountain then dips towards the lake 
the way tendrils of mist scurl down to the blue, like souls reaching out to the world. The shock of being taken away too soon, of being pushed back out to the wild sky. Thank you, David. That was really splendid, a really wonderful, remarkable reading. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask all the poets to come back to uh, um, be quizzed. Uh, so if you have any questions that you're, you've been meaning to put up there, do, do straight away. Uh, the couple of things that I wanted to ask first, I think because when there's a when there's ever uh, a public uh, disaster or the, there's something in there, or even uh, it may not be disastrous, a public, say, a wedding, a, a royal wedding, um, uh, people write poems. I'm wondering about why, why we... Uh, I can see that David's pamphlet, this collection, really was necessary. It needed to be written. And the response, writing in poems, poetry rather than prose, Seems appropriate. I wondered if the if people if if each of you had something to um, to respond to in that way. I remember when the Gulf War was on, and I went into the office, and Janet Fisher said, "Oh, we had a woman in today with some poems about golf." That's what I heard. But in fact, it was about the Gulf. It didn't anyway. Um, so, why do people write poems at this? You know, when there are things like this, and do do you write? Would you write? Be writing anyway? have um so david i suppose you you need to respond first yeah it's um it's a good question isn't it um i mean a lot of a lot of writing i find or the writing that you feel that is the most that you're most most proud of or that feels the most important is is that which is getting at something that you can't ordinarily express just in your daily conversations or um, ruminances and trying to sort of express something that is that is really hard to express. So in the same way that people turn to poetry at weddings and, and funerals, these big, big, big moments where you're looking for something that you can't ordinarily get at. And I think whenever there's a, a huge, massive... Um, event in our lives it, it you know whether it's a, a private or a public thing that can often drive us uh, back sort of scrabbling for the notepad can't it um I know I know for myself my I've become exceptionally lazy in terms of writing um I I write an awful lot less than I used to um and this was a kind of it felt like I needed to write all of a sudden Whereas I'd moved away from writing a little bit, not not out of any antipathy or any any bad feeling. It just didn't. It just felt like I needed to do some writing all of a sudden, if that makes sense. Whereas sometimes I'll, I'll just play my video games or see my friends or go for a beer. You know, writing doesn't always feel as urgent as uh, as it could. But it, during this moment, it felt urgent for once. You know, Aiden uh, and. I want to add a, a slightly different question to this because if you can respond to this, it would be great. But do you do you write in English? Are the, the English poems are they written in English? And do you have a do you make a decision? I think Aidan's very still there because he, he's not actually frozen. He just wants to avoid the question. Uh, Kim, do you, want, do you want to answer for him or? I don't know about Aidan's um, translation decisions, but um, back to that question about writing about kind of things that are happening in the moment. Um, I hadn't written anything about kind of COVID type stuff that was happening until I saw on social media this long discussion from poets saying, oh, COVID poems, oh, we don't want to read COVID. <laughs> and then I immediately started writing um, a few poems because I just thought, how dare you t try and tell people what, to what to write about or not to write about and this was quite early on as well and I know David was right you know David was already kind of in the thick of it whereas we were we were like months behind weren't we and um it made me really angry and kind of kind of feeds into this idea that poets should be in this beautiful ivory tower writing about I don't know 
things that are fit subject for poetry. So as soon as someone tells me not to do something, it makes me want to to lean into it and do it more to annoy them. I think there is that about poets, isn't there? There's a kind of um, contrariness. And uh, uh, a supplementary question for you, Kim, is is there a difference between writing prose and writing poems? Because you're on with this trumpet book now. Um, I feel like with poems, I had like, David talking about that urgency or that need to write I have to have that need to write but with prose I could quite happily just sit there and witter on for (laughs) for hours and hours so I think prose feels more revealing as well like it feels more like me is in is in there whereas the poems are something I can hide behind like they're they're very controlled and I only reveal exactly what I want to reveal whereas the prose it just feels like I'm leaking out all over the place and then yeah, so it feels it feels different in that way. But I also really I enjoy them in different ways. I think I can't I've not been doing them at the same time though. Like I haven't been writing poems because I've been doing this trumpet book and obsessing about that. But yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I a question. I think Aiden might be there now and you've turned your video off to give you some bandwidth. Is that what's happening there? Um, so he he did freeze, but he's he's back in the chat. So he's around, but I think there's maybe an internet connection. We could try. Aiden, can you can you speak now? It's like he's on the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said he's speaking, but we can't hear him. So I'm guessing I'm guessing there is a problem. So maybe we can uh, we can go back to. Um, we can go back to Aidan with a question in a bit, maybe. Why do you write poems, David? What made you be a poet? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Why did I write poems? Why do I write poems? Well, I was bullied at school. That's always handy, isn't it? <laughs> so if it <laughs> you know, like if you, if you need sort of like something to scribble into and, and sort of vent your fury, that's quite, that's quite useful. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's because quite often um, I have a think about things and the way I want to say things and just put put the words together. And, and then I got into the habit of, of writing poetry and then enjoying the, the process of reading poetry mo- mostly. Yeah. And then thinking, OK, I'm going to I'm going to have a go at writing some of these things. And it's just sort of kicked on from there, really. Um, I don't really have a, uh, a particularly um, wise or academic response to it. I've always I've always just enjoyed the process of writing and and putting poems together and 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 so on. Um, and would you agree? And would you agree, Kim, that that people who write poems are poets? But we know some people who don't write particularly good poems, but you can see that they are poets. They're saddled with it, you know? And I feel I'm like that, really. Whatever else I do, I'll always be a poet, you know? It's just, there's no escape, even when I'm not writing. <laughs> I met this um, this poet, this Spanish poet, who said, I'm always a poet, even when I'm taking out the bins. <laughs> I quite liked that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, although it's that also alarms me as well but um yeah yeah I lost track of the what 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 question am I asking Pete, uh, answering sorry <laughs> well we I'm giggling at David's thing about bullying uh, being poets being bullied at school still so we've had a question actually I know that we're actually going to run out of time if we're not careful but um Estelle Price has asked David about your choice of form they're often regular couplets, tercets. Was this a conscious decision? Um, yes, um, <laughs> it was. Uh, I like couplets. Um, I like starting to write in couplets for the most part um, because it feels as though you have a lot of um, you have a lot of wiggle room with couplets, and you can do sort of meaningful pauses that that go over a stanza, but it's not. You know, you get away with it because nobody really takes a couplet seriously as a stanza. So you, they're much more forgiving, um, which is nice. And also, I quite like sonnet, the sonnet form, sort of short, sweet, 14 lines and on to the next one um, <laughs> with like a twist uh, somewhere in the poem. So I, I do gravitate towards couplets and sonnets. And I think that's just because ultimately I write in a way that's... Um, 
often a um, a bit more lyrical, um, I guess. So, yes. Kim, do you have a sense of form as a, a useful tool in when you're writing, even if you don't stay with it in the final version? Mm, yeah, I think when I'm first writing it, I just write in prose and I've always kind of been, um, me and David used to go to a lot of workshops together, didn't we? And I would have this turgid mass of prose on the page that was just regurgitated nonsense and not regurgitated, just nonsense, just prose. And David would sit there for the 10 minutes of the writing exercise and then write this beautifully formed sonnet with all the line breaks and the rhymes and everything. And I think my, my theory is that David does a lot of writing in his head and then he just sits down and it all comes out, whereas I have to get it out and then cut back. But um, I don't know if that's the same now, David, it could have changed, but I always remember you doing that, um, just pulling a perfectly formed poem out. Um, whereas my, my process is much more like having a big block of rock like a sculptor and then having to find the poem in the big big mass of rock um but yeah the for form I, I i think the form should always the, the, one of the most useful questions when i was doing the phd I, my supervisor was michael simmons roberts and i used to bring him a poem in like a long column which is basically normally means i haven't it's like a really early draft for me and he'd say kim why is it in this form and i'd say don't know michael and then he'd say well go and have a reason go and find a reason or if there's not a reason then go and it's not the right form so I think you should always have a kind of uh I try and always have a reason and um, um a defense for why the poem is in the form that it is even if readers don't might not necessarily agree but yeah um yeah that's a really good point Kim I'd forgotten about our our different ways of uh of getting that for me it's it's still the same it's like those poems that I've been I've been reading they pretty much are as they came out with just tweaks um but increasingly irregular that I that I actually write something I suppose but it's still it's still that case but sometimes when there's there are certain poems where maybe I could have written certain poems but I just I gave up on them too quickly because I'm I'm not used to the bashing everything into into position technique, if that makes sense. <laughs> <as well. laughs> it either works first time or it doesn't work at all sometimes. Uh, maybe I'm a bit yeah. lazy, you know. Uh, the 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 poem and the expression uh, are often one and the same, aren't they? They they come out that way. And but if it's there to be chipped away, that's a different thing, isn't it? Um, there is one more question, uh, but we haven't got time to answer. So, but I, I'm going to voice it. So it's really important for people to be listening about this. Um, Aidan, uh, I'm afraid, is, is list, can listen, but uh, can't get um, back onto screen. We're going to hear a poem by David to end, but um, from Camille Macaulay, uh, she says, writing about tra traumatic experiences can be a cathartic way of processing difficult situations, but reading them publicly could bring back those feelings and could potentially be damaging. What do we think about this? Um, well, we haven't got time to answer it, but I, I would say I feel, I felt, as David's editor on this pamphlet, uplifted by the poems even when they were really difficult when it was difficult material and and very clear-eyed in its response to it I felt that fullness of expression that happens with real poetry you know was actually a you know um as I say uplifting or at least enlightening and not damaging quite the opposite even if it wasn't Amelia ah there you are and very nice to see you. Thank oh, you, okay. all three of you, uh, for being part of it. We, we're, we've got one minute, David, so it won't matter if we go slightly over time. But I'd like to thank um, Aidan Hong, uh, Kim Moore and David Tate. I'd like David to end the, uh, the event today by reading uh, one last poem. Thank you, uh, Peter. And thanks, everyone, again, for joining. Thanks very much to, uh, to Kim. Um, and Aidan for reading alongside me as well. Um, I'm going to finish with a poem called um, The Last Road Trip, um, which is for my, my dear friend David Agnew, who sadly passed away a, a few years ago. Um, but I wrote this poem for him, which, um, felt, which felt appropriate um, also um, within, the, within the book. Um, David Agnew was um, a friend of ours who was a member of the 
the Leeds Writers Circle, where I kind of learned to be a poet, I suppose, or, or had that community around me for the for the first time. A very kind, a very kind man. Um, he had suffered with um, addiction issues in when he was younger. He was a recovering alcoholic, and he always used to love going to Whitby. He always used to say that Whitby restored him. Um, and even though he was struggling, poetry sort of, he'd write these poems that were full of like ridiculous, unpublishable things like nymphs. Um, and he always used to write about the, the bloody great blocks of flats that he lived and the student accommodation that he hated. And he used to drive this, um, this little red Ford car and he used to go off to Whitby. And he was, he was a wonderful, very kind uh, man from Belfast who always used to wear a jumper that said Whitby Life lifeboat and he, an influence I think for for myself for Kim um, a wonderful man and it feels right to finish with this uh, for him um, the last road trip you already know the road to heaven that familiar click of the key in the lock as you leave behind the bloody great blocks of flats and walk towards your red Ford car leads recedes in the mirrors as you head for the A64, and on the back seat sit all those things we tried to edit, the nymphs and all your fancy verbs, that shrewd malevolent parrot. You soar past the Red Bus Cafe, turn off for the North York Moor, that low slong, slow bend past Filing Dales, just a hill or two away. And what can we say, we who are left behind? You are a good man, you were kind, you were sick breaks and a lifeboat jumper, a long, slow walk around the lighthouse. Maybe we could have done more, but already you're reaching that final hill, the harbour spreading its astonished arms and a few small boats on the water. Thanks very much, everybody.